Happy holidays. We hope you're having a great holiday season, spending some time with friends, family, and loved ones, and enjoying some Flames hockey at the same time. This isn't a new episode of Fireside Chat, but instead re-releasing an interview that I did with the Bash Brothers podcast a couple weeks ago, talking about the Jerome McGinley homecoming, the change in general manager here in Calgary, and I thought I'd release it to our audience to listen to. If you like what you hear, you can find the Bash Brothers podcast and listen to them every week at www.hockeypodcastdirectory.com, and the link will be in the show notes as well on our website. Enjoy. We are joined by Dan Stevenson of the Fireside Chat, uh, one of the members of the Brotherhood of the uh, Hockey Podcast Directory. So, uh, Dan, thank you for taking time to join us and talk about some Calgary Flames hockey. Thanks for having me on, guys. Well, I um, love. Oh, oh, I go ahead. Wanted, I wanted to start by saying I love your uh, the name of your show. I think it's very clever and good. Very clever. I enjoy it. Fireside Flames. Yeah, I like thanks. It. When we started the podcast, we were you know trying to get a Flames like name. I mean, everything this team does is somewhat fire related somewhere, and we came up with this. Actually, it was my co-host Luke who came up with it. And I guess uh, one of the former presidents, um, whoever served during World War II in the U.S., had weekly fireside chats on the radio where he'd give a State of the Union address to the people of the U.S. So we kind of borrowed that name because that's what we're doing for the Flames. Yeah, that's uh, – yeah, that, that, I don't remember who it was. Wasn't it uh, – was it the first president that made radio addresses, Justin? Do you have any idea? I, I didn't even know we had radios in World War or whatever <laughs> – well, there you go. It shows our knowledge. Yeah. <laughs> um, See, no. I'm a Canadian. I don't know anything about uh, which president served when. So I can tell you the prime ministers, but not the presidents. Well, we live in America. We probably couldn't even tell you the presidents. So, <laughs> well, uh, well, let me uh, let me just fire one question at you, and no pun intended, uh, to start the show or to start the interview. Did you like Jay Feaster? Yes, I did. Really? You so you're the guy. I think that you, <laughs> I, I'm the well. I I don't think I'm the only guy. Um, I think it's it's all relative. Do I think Jay Feaster would be the right guy for this team in a different scenario? No. Um, I think he was the right guy to come in after Daryl Sutter, based on who was available at the time. Um, he has a Stanley Cup ring. I mean, he obviously knows what he's doing somewhere. Um, he's worked in the AHL for a long time, so as far as a rebuild goes, I think that he understands that development process a little bit. And I think he was at least the right guy to give it a try to. I mean, he's got a, an, a Stanley Cup ring. He's got some experience there. I think we just needed a change that was different than the Sutters, and I think he was the right guy at the time. I still don't think that they should have fired him, but... Um, but with Brian, I Burke imagine that'll lead into your next question. Yeah, I was going to say, with Brian Burke coming in, did you kind of see that coming? Did you see that possibly sometime this year uh, will Jay Feaster be fired? Well, it's interesting. I was saying this to some people that I was talking to earlier this year. I don't know how much you guys have followed the Flames front office, but Jay Feaster was originally brought in as the assistant general manager to Daryl Sutter at the time. And everybody kind of joked that you don't bring in a guy with the Stanley Cup ring to be the assistant to to the other guy. So everyone knew at the time Jay was the heir apparent. At some point, he was going to take over, we all thought. And, yeah, when Brian Burke came in, I had a notion in the back of my head that Feaster wouldn't be around long. But they kept saying, and they're still saying to this day, that um, – Burke is not going to be the next GM. Burke is there as a consultant. He's there kind of above Feaster, but he doesn't want to be the GM. So I guess I resign myself to that fact that, okay, he's here to help, and Jay's here to be the GM. Because Jay had a whole team in place. He had John Weisbrot. He has Craig Conroy. He kind of established a whole team, so it wasn't just him. So, yeah, I kind of expected at least that Feaster, they let him see out the year. He's kind of started this rebuild, and I figured he got to give the guy a year to get his plan executed. Um, yeah, that, I mean, I agree. Brian Burke did say uh, in his press conference that he did not go there to become the GM. Um, he'll only be the GM for a short time. Um, and he also added that he was very happy with the coaching staff. He doesn't see there's going to be any changes. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Are you a fan of Bob Hartley? Do you think he needs to uh, live out at least the rest of this season, maybe uh, start out next year and, and see what he does with this roster? 
Yeah, I, I would not be looking if I was in the office there to fire Hartley. I think Hartley's the right guy right now. Again, a guy with a Stanley Cup ring, a guy who has some developmental experience, and he seems to be bringing something to this team that we haven't had in a while. He's trying to bring team unity back. It seemed like under the Sutters and Keenan and some of the other guys that we had here, everything was just about players freelancing and doing their own thing. And Hartley seems to be trying to build team effort here and you know build a team identity both on and off the ice. And I think you got to commend him for that. And I think that he's deserved the right to stay here for at least this season. I wouldn't look at firing him next season unless somebody else um, got fired. And maybe then you got to look at making a coaching change to bring in a bigger name. But I like Hartley, and I'd keep him here. Um, something I think, uh, uh, Justin, do you have any more questions about uh, Feaster or Weesbro or anyone else that was uh, let go or any changes in the management before I move on? No, I had to throw my whole question set out because I was six, I had my pitchfork and my torch ready. I was ready to <laughs> go after Feaster, but uh, I, I like I said, I, I, I just, I'm, I'm stunned. I, I was really surprised that you're such a supporter. I mean, I, in a way, I think it's great. I mean, it shows a sign of a true fan of, uh, you know, I mean, you. Your logic was very sound in what you said, so I, I never really looked at it in that light. I. I guess uh, the moves I saw from a third-party perspective, I was just like, it's all crap. But uh, <laughs> but no, yeah, I... Well, I'm, you know, Justin... <laughs> go go, ahead, go no. ahead, finish up. No, I'm... I'm I was like going to say, I'm, I'm based stunned. on that, I've heard... <laughs> yeah, I've heard that from a lot of people, that Feaster made some bad moves. And uh, I guess I, I tr- tend to defend him. I mean, I'm not necessarily a Jay Feaster fan in as Jay Feaster, but I'm just a fan of him as a professional and what he's done. Um, I don't see any bad moves. If you look at some of the stuff that he's done, I mean, he brought Mike Camilleri back. He brought in Kerry Ramo. He's been able to bring in guys like Chris Russell and Joe Colburn and give up very little for them. As far as a rebuild goes, I think he's put this team where they need to be. We could argue that, yes, maybe he could have got more for Jerome last year, but none of us know what was going on behind the scenes, what was offered, what wasn't. Um, some people you know, complain about the Ryan O'Reilly thing, that we tried to sign him as an RFA. I really think that was a good move as a guy who's getting into a rebuild. I think you needed a young superstar to come in, and I don't think it would have cost the draft pick. I don't know if you guys remember all that, but there was a rumor because he was playing in Europe or something that we would have had to give up an extra draft pick, but nobody knew that. I think that the NHL would have ruled in the Flames' favor there and said, yeah, okay, nobody knew that, so you don't need to give up the extra compensation. But you got to make risky moves to get – Return, and that's what I think Feaster's done. And I think any GM, if you look back, any GM that's helmed a successful team or even a somewhat successful team, even an unsuccessful team like our rivals to the North, the Oilers, there's always you know moves there that you could question later. But I think you have to make risky moves in order to get ahead. Well, so, to actually defend Feaster on that uh, Ryan O'Reilly, people forget he wasn't the only one that tried to sign him to an offer sheet. There was apparently five or six teams that were doing the same thing. It's just the Flames were the ones that really kind of stepped out and actually did it. So, uh, you know, you don't hear me yeah. defend him much. But, yeah, that was one time where I said, hey, he wasn't the only one that didn't know that rule. Yeah, exactly, and that's the thing. If we weren't the only ones, if the Flames weren't the only ones, and nobody around the NHL knew, I don't think the NHL could have ruled and said, well, you guys should have known this. I mean, the best scouts in the world work for these teams, and if we were not the only ones that missed something – you know, it's not our it's not our fault here. Well, uh, we want to talk about something a little happier, I guess, in in Calgary. Call it happy if you want. Jerome McGinley's return, which we already mentioned uh, earlier on this show. Uh, I loved the fact that he was able to skate out and stay out for as long as he did at the end of the game. And I love that the Calgary Flam of uh, Calgary Flames fans were uh, very happy to welcome him back. Didn't boo him. Um, just, you know, respect for a player is great, and um, I think he loved hearing that, and, and I'm sure it warmed his heart knowing that uh, what he now probably calls his hometown still respects him the way that they do. So Yeah, you know, I didn't expect anything different. Oh, go ahead, sorry. Oh, no, I was just going to say, go ahead and comment on that. Tell me what you thought of his return and what you thought about uh, the, the, flame, the Flames' reaction. Sure. Well, before we comment on the return, let's go back a little bit to the thoughts around town last year when he got moved. 
And I think as a Flames fan, as a diehard Flames fan, I've been a Jerome Ginla fan for a long time because he was the face of this franchise. I think in order to be a real Flames fan, you had to be. And I will admit I was probably a little bit in denial. Um, I've said this on our show. Yeah, Jerome was starting to decline. Yeah, Jerome was starting to not play the way that he did when he was younger. But I guess I was in denial because I didn't want to say that Jerome is needing to be moved. Jerome needs to be, you know, traded or shaken up or something needs to be done there because he was the face of this franchise. And thinking of a post-Jerome McGinley era was a scary thing for me as a Flames fan. I remember when we went through that with Theo Fleury. And I think last year when he got moved, everybody realized both for the team and for Jerome, it had to be done. Um, we had to move him. We had to move on to this post-Jerome McGinley era and prove that we can rebuild this team and we can move past Jerome. And I think everybody realized it was done. Jerome was trying to look out for Jerome, but Jerome was also trying to look out, I think, for the Flames. And the Flames were trying to look out for Jerome and them too. So it was a mutual uh, breakup, if you will. It wasn't Jerome saying, I want to get out of here, just move me tomorrow. We had a lot of time. We all know that the move took a while. There were lots of pieces in play, lots of teams that we talked to. So I think everyone was happy with the move, unlike when Theo Fleury left town. And I was glad to see that he was welcomed back with open arms. I think Jerome will always be a Calgary Flame in people's minds. I think Jerome will get his number raised to the rafters here when he uh, retires. And I think that it's great, like you said, that his adopted hometown is still behind him. I've heard a lot of Flames fans this week say that they are Flames fans and Jerome McGinley fans, and they follow the Bruins because of that. Um, I was talking to a local Jersey City owner, and he said that he sold out of Bruins jerseys with number 12 on the back. He wow. doesn't sell anyone else, but he sold out of jerseys with number 12 on the back because everybody here loves Jerome still. So, yeah, I think it's great. Um, I will tell you guys, and I've said this on our show, I don't think Jerome is done with the Flames organization. He may never play here again, but I see him coming back in some capacity. There's a coach or in the front office. I don't think he's done here. And I wouldn't be surprised if he does come back to play here again. I wouldn't be surprised if in his last year, trade for him at the deadline or something, you know, give up virtually nothing, get him out here, play 20 games, skate out, and that's his victory lap, if you will. Yeah, I mean, we've seen that already with the L.A. Kings and Luke Robitaille, the St. Louis Blues, Brett Hall, and... Um, you know, other organizations are starting to do that, the ambassador to the team, whatever they want to call it. Um, I definitely agree with you. I, I couldn't imagine, and, and I, Jerome McGinley is such a lovable figure that I think he will stick around the NHL long after he retires, and I don't see any other organization yeah. uh, being able to give him a job that, uh, you know, I feel like the, the Flames could undercut him some money and he would still take a job with the Calgary Flames just because I agree. that's And one team. thing you guys don't see being outside of town, um, Jerome was a lot more for this city than just a hockey player. He was the face of this franchise. He was the guy that did all the media events. He's the guy that would do all of the charity events. He was the guy that would be last out of the children's hospital, making sure that every kid that wanted a picture and an autograph was there doing that. And I said to my co-hosts quite often, this team loses more than a hockey player. This team loses one of the best ambassadors that it currently has. And I'm glad to see that after he left, some of the other guys on the team um, – guys like Giordano and some of the um, other veterans, Glenn Cross, have really stepped up to fill that void. Because my worry was exactly that, that that ambassador was going to be gone. I mean, he was such a face of the franchise. He did things outside of hockey that people outside this city don't see. And I was worried we were going to lose that. So kudos to everyone else for stepping up. But yeah, I agree with you, Jeff. Um, the Flames could probably lowball him, get him back for one more year just to do a victory lap or to skate on a line with the heir apparent, whether that's Monaghan or whoever we draft this year, just to kind of give him that farewell, raise his jersey, put him in the office, or make him the alumni ambassador or something like that. And I think he'll be around here for a while. Damn it, Dan. You're taking the wind out of my sails. I'm I'm the cynic on the show. How am I supposed to be cynical when you're <laughs> you're so hopeful and everything you say makes sense? I, I I I can't pick it apart. I mean I'm I I had to scrap all my questions. It's out the window. <laughs> I don't even know what to do anymore. <laughs> I, I'm I'm sorry that ruined your fun. Uh, uh. Well, uh, we do have one more question. I, I, for Justin, we... I, I think that I, I've become positive, and I've, you know, I have kind of the outlook I do because we need to right now with where the flames are. And I think that if we start doubting things or we start being cynical, um, we're going to drive ourselves mad as fans. So I always try to look at the upside of things, and you know, 
assume maybe, you know, with rose-colored glasses, but I try to assume that everything's going to work out in the end and everything's going to have a storybook ending. So. Well, I think that's a sign of a real hockey town. I mean, we get uh, we get a little hellacious here in St. Louis when we just, like, drop a game or two. So I, I'm i just so used to... Oh, we to... do too. Don't get me wrong. Oh, you're in the same... <laughs> okay, well, that's good to know. I think that's every hockey city, to be I honest. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm in one of the biggest hockey markets in Canada. When the Flames lose one game, people freak out. But I think part of our job is as podcasters and broadcasters for this team is to remind people that, you know, it's a long season. Nobody wins them all. It's okay to lose one game once in a while, and especially for us, it's a rebuild. We're going to lose a lot of them. Let's be frank. This is what we're going to do this year. So I think it's partly our job to look on the upside and, you know, remind people what this actually means. I have a question for you, kind of off off uh, topic, but uh, first of all, are you sure. a fantasy hockey player? A little bit. Um, I'm not playing as much as I used to just because I don't have as much time anymore. Last year I was in two or three leagues, and this year I'm just doing one of them. So I I always play in a playoff pool, and this year I'm doing just one regular season pool as well. Okay. Well, I want to go ahead and ask you, because there are Flames fans just like any other city in the NHL that they want a flame, they at least want one Flames player on their team. So if you were to say, take this one guy, let's take Mike Camilleri out of the mix just because he's the obvious choice to me at least, but... Um, who would be the one Calgary Flame that you would tell people is a surefire guy that you would want on your roster? I think it depends what type of pool you're playing in. If you're playing in a keeper league where you're going to get to keep a player from year to year or all your players, I would say for sure take Sean Monaghan. Um, he's our rookie sensation this year. I think he's only going to get better. So if you can pick up money in your uh, league and you can keep him, I think it's going to be a long-term investment. If you're not playing a keeper league and you just want a guy that you can play for the end of the year, I mean, every league has different point structures and that sort of thing. Uh, Monaghan would still be a good choice as a guy for just this year. But I think if you're willing to take a little bit of a flyer, um, taking Mikael Backlund might be a good idea. Or if you need a defenseman, um, Mark Giordano is now healthy. He'd probably be my pick there. So depends on your league, but those are the three guys I would be uh, airing towards. Don't take a Calgary goalie. We're going through too many of them, and we're cycling them in and out quickly. So you're not going to get a lot of points with either one of our guys. I learned that the hard way with Joey McDonald. <laughs> <laughs> you got an AHL pool. He's a great pick right now. Oh, well, that's good. Uh, Justin, any more questions from you? I'm, I'm defeated. I'm done. I'm throwing in the towel. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, like I said, we want to close up the interview with you being able to talk about your show, Fireside Chat. We already talked about where the name came from, but if somebody wanted to tune into your show, what would they hear every time they would hear it? Would it be uh, is it very discussion based? Do you guys hit the team news, the games? You know, what's what do you hear when you listen to the Fireside Chat uh, provided by the great Dan Stevenson? Um, well, I can't take all the credit for Fireside Chat. I have two great co-hosts with me, uh, Matt and Luke. And every week we try to discuss the news of the team. Our kind of mandate when we set out was here in Calgary we have Fan 960, the team radio station. And they do six to seven hours of Flames talk a day. We don't want to be doing the same Flames talk they do. We don't want to be repeating things and breaking down every little nuance of the game because we have to fill airtime. We talk for as long as we feel we need to talk for. Usually it's about a, an hour a week. And it's discussion about the team. It's discussion about things going on, um, perhaps some rumors that might be circulating if we have a good source on them. Um, breaking down, our last episode was uh, Monaghan versus Berchi. So it was just an episode looking at kind of our two young guys and why one of them succeeding and one's not. Um, but, yeah, it's just team news, team, excuse me, team news, team discussion, um, breaking down the lockout and we – or, sorry, the uh, rebuild – and we find the rebuild to be quite interesting because it's given us a look at a lot of guys that we might not get a look at otherwise. So we're trying to get fans acquainted with some of the players that we think they'll see going forward, looking at uh, players within the system, and just talking Flames on a regular basis. Um, in the new year, we're going to be changing our format a little bit. So if you're a Flames fan, you'll probably appreciate some of what we're doing. We're going to be tracking down some old Flames and doing Where Are They Now segments. We're going to be talking about some of our favorite players at each position, and we're going to be looking at some of the guys in the system, guys you may not have heard of who are excelling. I don't know if you know, but the Flames AHL team is doing really well this year. So just everything to do with the Flames, whether it's past or present or future, we try to talk about it weekly. 
And if that sounds like something you're interested in, uh, you can find us online at firesidechat.ca. That's not .com. .ca is for Canadian sites. So firesidechat.ca. And you'll find, if you go to our site, all our podcasts. we got some great articles that we do. And you'll find all our social media. You'll find where to find us on Facebook, Twitter, Google+. Great. That was going to be my next question. Well, uh, well, Dan, thank you very much for joining us. It was a pleasure having you on. We'll have to have you on again sometime to uh, talk some more flames with us. But uh, really appreciate it. Keep up the good work, and uh, we'll be sure to give you as many plugs as possible. As uh, I'm sure Thanks, you guys, guys. Will be talking, you'll be talking a lot of what's going on right now in Calgary. We will be. And Jeff, anytime you need to shut Justin up, it looks like you can bring me on, and we can get that done. Ah, that sounds good to me. <laughs> yeah, no, I I really appreciate you. Uh, you know, providing a, you know that's what Jeff and I are trying to do. We're trying to get uh, really good interviews of people that are really passionate, and uh, I can tell you're a passionate guy, and uh, you know you're. Not about the red tape and the fluff. I mean, you're well spoken and you love your team, and uh, that's what we're trying to bring to our fans and people around the league is, uh, you know, getting people hooked up with uh, other passionate fans. And, and you, uh, you hit the, uh, you hit it out of the park today. So uh, we appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot, guys. All right, thank you. You're welcome.